Let's continue on where we left off. We had the potential energy curves E plus and E minus for the molecular ion um, H2 plus. In this lecture, I want to take a closer look at the molecular orbital we got. In, in first, I want to figure out what it actually is. We started out with these two bases functions. We still need to figure out the coefficients. You can probably guess by the names E plus and E minus what the coefficients are going to be and the symmetry of the problem. But let's play dumb for the time being and pretend we don't know. And then if we don't know, we will have an algorithm to figure it out. And then we're going to look at some measure of the quality of the kind of orbital that we got. And that's a little bit of a deeper investigation that's going to lead us into something called the Virial Theorem, um, which I believe was developed by Clausius of the clausius clapeyron equation. Well, we have some experimental values, but we won't always have experimental values for everything. But in this case, we do. Let's then, um, and, and also we have very extensive calculations, and the variational principle tells us that no matter how big we make our basis set, we're going to be above the ground state energy unless we have very bad round-off error. So we have to do an accurate calculation. If you make things too big and you're too inaccurate, you can end up below by mistake because of numerical round-off problems. We end up with R um, in units of A0 being 2.49, that's what I said last time, was about 2, or between 2 and 4, which is uh, about 132 picometers. And the minimum energy is getting rid of the minus a half, which is just the hydrogen atom, is minus 0 0.064831 Hartree, which is minus 1.758 electron volts, which is minus 169.6 kilojoules per mole in units that chemists are more used to. The true values, of course, are better. The true values are that big R is just 2A0, which is about 106 picometers instead of 132. And the energy is better, of course. The true energy is minus 0.10264 hard tree, minus 2.79 electron volts, or minus 269.5 kilojoules per mole. This leads us to believe that, uh, you know, we did okay, but after all, we, we took a very simple um, approach, so it's amazing that it even works at all. And you can go back and ask yourself why it does work, and what you will conclude is that it's only on account of that integral k, the exchange integral, that it can possibly be stable. You can test that out on your own as a little practice problem. Get rid of k and see how it goes, and you will see that it's only this non-classical thing where we have the two wave functions interacting with this operator in between that we end up with um, something that can be stable, in fact. Now, it's kind of ironic that after fiddling around with a secular determinant and so forth, which, after all, we, we wanted to do that in the first place to solve for the coefficients the C's that go, tell us how much of 1SA and how much of 1SB is in the answer. We had this linear algebra problem. We said one answer for it to be zero is both C's are zero. That one's a dud, pretty uninteresting. The other answer is the secular determinant. Then we had those matrix elements. Then we had to work out what those were. Now we know what those are. So now we go back to our problem to figure out what these coefficients, which I'm going to call CA and CB, are. CA is for 1SA, CB is for 1SB. Let's go back to the linear equations we began with and substitute in each of the energy solutions in turn. 
because they will have different coefficients because they're different energies and they're different wave functions. The first uh, equation we get is CA times HAA minus E plus CB times HAB minus ES, remember those were our equations, equals to zero. But now we can put in E is either E plus or E minus. If I put in E plus, what I get is what I've got on slide 597. This big equation, CA, HAA, so forth and so on, plus CB, and another thing, equals to zero. And if I expand it out, which I've done in the second line, and then simplify it, what I find is that I have CA times S times HAA minus HAB plus CB times HAB minus SHAA, which is the opposite, equals to zero. So that means that CA and CB are the same because the other things are like 1 and minus 1. That means CA is equal to CB and that means that for the plus energy I have 1SA plus 1SB. And so that's not surprisingly why we called it plus. And so now here I'm writing psi plus is equal to some constant CA, I don't need to use CB, times 1SA plus 1SB. Now I still need to normalize because the integral of psi plus squared over all space should be 1. And I've done that here. Um, the integral is easy because um, remember it's 1SA plus 1SB times 1SA plus 1SB. 1SA squared is 1 because that's normalized. 1SB squared is 1. BA and AB are S and we know S. Therefore what we get is um, the integral is equal to CA squared times 2 plus 2s, which I can factor as 2 times 1 plus s. Therefore, CA is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 times quantity 1 plus s. And so I can write my final result. Psi plus is 1 over the square root of 2 times 1 plus the overlap integral times 1sA plus 1sB. And I've tidied it up, and I know exactly what the energy is, and I know exactly what the minimum um, internuclear distance is and what the potential surface looks like. That looks great. With exactly the same sequence of steps, but instead of substituting in the positive energy, I substitute in the negative energy, I get 1 over the square root of 2 times 1 minus s rather than 1 plus s times quantity 1sA minus 1sB. And I have to choose which one's going to be plus and minus, but it doesn't matter because remember, the phase of the wave function doesn't matter. We usually choose it to be real if we can because we're very biased about that. But whether there's a minus one out in front or not, it doesn't change the overall probability density. And so whether it's 1SA minus 1SB or the other way around, it's the same thing. It doesn't change anything about the problem. The orbitals, though, here I've, I've drawn them. I wouldn't swear that these are 100% um, accurate, but they're probably pretty accurate. When the uh, two nuclei are far apart, there are two cases um, that I've got here in red and, red and blue, kind of an angry looking red, but um, um, two of them are in phase, 1SA, 1SB, they're both red. Or one of them is the opposite phase, a negative uh, wave function. Remember, that's nothing to do with charge density. That's just the phase, of, of whether it's minus or plus. And that's in blue. And then if we bring the two red ones together, we bring these exponentials. Remember, they have a cusp at the nucleus, so they look like that, like a little tent. We bring these tents together as they get closer. And in between where they're both positive, 
they kind of make a, a cat, catenary like a bridge <clears throat> or at a movie studio where they keep you out, a movie theater rather, where they keep you out by hanging those uh, velour things. And then if I square it, then where it's big and it adds up, when, when you square it, it gets bigger. And that means in some sense that the electron is spending a lot of time in between the two positive charges, which is perfect when you want to think of the, you know, the electron gluing the nuclei together. That's where you would expect it to be, and you get this kind of sausage-shaped thing. The exact shape of the sausage depends on how close you allow the nuclei to get. And then in the second line, one, one of them's blue, and it's the uh, out of phase combination. Now I've got two things, but one of them's hot, one of them's cold, and in the middle it's zero. As you bring them together, they just cancel out more and more. In fact, if you brought them right on top of each other, they disappear. That's very bad. And what happens is, as they come together, in between the two nuclei, it's always zero. In other words, there's a nodal plane. And I've, I've colored that, the top part red and the bottom part blue, in the, in the third uh, figure on the second line. And then when you square that, of course, when you square it, they should both be red, because when you square it, it's a positive number. But what I've done is I've left one of them blue, and I've squared it anyway to show that in between where they cancel, then when you square it, they really cancel in between. And that really explains why that one is repulsive. Because if it's canceling, and as you get closer and closer, it cancels more and more and more, then all that happens is the protons see each other right up close, and they hate each other because they've got a huge positive um, repulsion. They're both positive charges. And that explains completely why that E minus curve just goes up and up and up. And only when they're very far apart and there's essentially no cancellation do they even have the same uh, uh, energy as zero of a hydrogen atom. The lowest energy solution with the, the atomic orbitals in phase is called a bonding orbital because it makes the um, atom, the nuclei stick together. And it's given the symbol sigma to indicate that it has S symmetry. It's cylindrically symmetrical. It's the most like S it can be and not be an atom. And the other solution with the atomic orbitals of opposite phase is called an anti-bonding orbital, and it's given the symbol sigma star. Star usually means excited or unfavorable or something like that, and that's exactly what this means. If you put an electron in there, it's unfavorable for the future of the molecule. The bonding orbital has even symmetry, and the anti-bonding orbital has odd symmetry. So the notation with our G and U might be sigma G for the one with even symmetry and sigma star U for the one with odd symmetry. And oftentimes molecular orbitals are labeled this way to help you understand what they look like. The surface then of the antibonding orbital is purely repulsive. There's a node between the two nuclei, and you cannot um, ever get uh, the molecule to be stable with that route. Now let's have a look at how good our solution is. We know it doesn't match the experiment, but what we'll find is that it's flawed in another way that we haven't even talked about. There's a powerful general observation from classical mechanics that relates the expectation value of the kinetic energy and the potential energy to whatever the force law is between the particles. If the force law is simple, um, then it's simple to figure out. And 
you may not have had a proper course in classical mechanics. Maybe that's later on in the series and you never got to it. Um, so I'm just going to tell you what this virial theorem says without deriving it. If we have a potential V of R that is something like a constant, let's say A times R to the N, where N is some power, then the virial theorem says that two times the expectation value of the kinetic energy, which I've called T here for short, rather than Ke, is equal to N times the expectation value of the potential energy. And that's equal to minus 1 times the expectation value of the potential energy because our potential with charged particles always has 1 over R. That's the potential. The force law is 1 over R squared. The potential is 1 over R. Um, so, now if, if we've got a different kind of force law, then we end up with a different ratio of T and V. The question is, um, does our um, solution, our um, wave function, does that satisfy the virial theorem or not? And that's, let's uh, have a look, because if it doesn't satisfy the virial theorem, then it's not very good, and that could be another reason why it's not very good. And that means if we can adjust it, if we can tweak it, so that it does satisfy the virial theorem, it's liable to be much, much better. This is kind of an independent check on our system because nowhere when we did this calculation did we say, oh, uh, by the way, two times the expectation value of the kinetic energy should be minus one times the expectation value of the potential energy. This is coming in at, like an auditor to a company and just saying, how good are the books? And we couldn't fiddle the books because we didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, let's then, as a practice problem, apply the virial theorem first to a classical harmonic oscillator, because it came from classical mechanics. There was no quantum mechanics when uh, Rudolf Clausius was proposing this. And then let's apply it to the ground state of the simple harmonic oscillator. Why? Well, we already had that wave function, and we'll see if the quantum oscillator and the classical oscillator both satisfy the virial theorem. And then after we do that, and, and we're confident that we know what we're doing, we'll apply it to our system and see how we do. Okay, practice problem 29. Consider a classical harmonic oscillator. It has reduced mass m and force constant k. Does it conform to the virial theorem? Part b, how about a quantum oscillator with the same values of k and m? Okay, here's our answer to part a. The total energy of the classical oscillator is E is equal to T plus V, which is one-half mv squared plus one-half kx squared. And of course, energy is conserved over time in the oscillator. It just changes form. If we take this and use Newton's equations, which is what we have to do, of course, to solve problems in classical mechanics, or if we get more advanced, we get into the Euler-Lagrange equations, but we won't do that here. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. F is equal to ma. Acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, m dv dt, and v is the derivative of the position. So F is equal to m d squared x dt squared. But force is also equal to the minus derivative of the potential, so that F is also equal to minus dv dx, but dv dx is the derivative of one-half kx squared, which is just kx. And so what we end up with is this um, equation on the middle of a slide 604, d squared x dt squared is equal to minus k over m times x. Well, this equation ought to be really 
really familiar because, look, it's exactly the same kind of thing with just some different variables as what we ran into with the particle in a box. We have the second derivative and this is equal to itself. Um, so it resembles the particle in a box just with a change of variables with time here rather than x and, and x being sort of like the wave function rather than um, uh, psi. But it's exactly. So let's suppose at time zero that the oscillator is extended to whatever the maximum it can be. Let's call it x max at time t equals zero. Or it could be compressed. But let's take it at the maximum. And let's assume that at the maximum that it's stationary. Well, it has to be stationary, otherwise it'd go farther. And if it were moving the other way, it couldn't have got there in the first place. So it's stationary. None of this matters to the problem one iota, but it makes it easier to calculate it. Then the solution is x of t is equal to x max cosine omega t, and v of t is equal to minus omega x max sine omega t, because v of t is the derivative of x of t. And omega, um, the angular velocity, uh, is equal to the square root of k upon m. Next, we have to say what we interpret the average kinetic energy and average potential energy to be. The interpretation in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is different. In classical mechanics, we interpret it to be a time average because the energy of, the, of this particle that has definite position and momentum at all times is changing between kinetic and potential. We want to take the time average and we want to take the time average over one cycle. So you go out, you come back, you go out, stop. That's the correct average. We don't want to include anything else. So we want to integrate um, over 2 pi in the angular variable, or 360 degrees around a circle, same thing. If we do that, then the average of the kinetic energy is, recall, if you're going to take the mean value of something, you have to divide it by the length. So it's 1 over 2 pi times the integral from omega t is equal to 0 to omega t is equal to 2 pi of dt times 1 half mv squared. And if I put in 1 half mv squared, I end up with um, omega squared x squared max sine squared omega t. I've got to do that integral of omega squared sine squared by parts or look it up. And if I do that, and go through the whole thing, I end up with this sequence of steps that the pi's cancel out as they always do, and I end up with kx max squared over 4. That's half of the available energy, because the most it can be is when it's stationary out at x max is 1 half kx max squared. This is half of that. Not surprisingly, then, um, the other part, the expectation value of the potential, is going to be the other half. And you could just assume that, and you'd be right, because energy is conserved. But I'm not going to assume that. I'm going to slug it out and calculate it so I can have more confidence in that I know what I'm doing. The expectation value of the potential energy is, again, 1 over 2 pi times the integral from omega t is equal to 0 to omega t is equal to 2 pi of dt 1 half kx squared, x depends on t, I put in my x squared cosine squared omega t, I do the integral again, and out comes kx squared max over 4. That's the other half. The average potential energy is thus exactly equal to the average kinetic energy for the classical harmonic oscillator. But what did the Virial theorem say? The Virial theorem says that 2 times the average of the kinetic energy is equal to n times the average of the potential energy. But n is 2 because our potential was 1 half kx squared. So then, 2t is equal to nv becomes 2t is 2v, and that's just t equals v. That's what we got. Therefore, 
That satisfies the virial theorem. Part B, for the quantum oscillator, recall in lecture 8 we solved that. Boy, that seems like a long time ago. We've covered a lot of ground since then. But here's the, here's the ground state wave function for the simple harmonic oscillator. I have m omega over h bar all divided by pi raised to the one-fourth power. I had that funny thing to normalize it. And then a Gaussian function e to the minus m omega x squared over 2h bar. I've just written exactly the same thing in slightly different terms to keep in the m and the omega um, so that it, it's more comparable to the classical oscillator, but there's nothing different here. Okay, now how do we calculate the average of the kinetic energy and the potential energy here? Well, we know how to. Um, we calculate the expectation value. That's what the angular brackets mean in quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, they may mean a time average, like we saw. But for quantum mechanics, we know exactly what to do. Um, so the expectation value of t, then, is the integral of the ground state wave function, and then I have minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x, again on the Gaussian. I take the derivative, down comes an x, and then I take a derivative of x e to the x and I get two terms, and I end up then with this term out in front, this big term, with the square root, uh, with two times root pi in the denominator, and I end up with two terms. One is h bar, the other is minus m omega x squared, all times the Gaussian. I have to do that integral by parts twice, and then I get the answer, and the answer comes out to be h bar omega over 4. How neat! because we know that the zero-point energy is h bar omega over 2. That was the energy that had to be there by the uncertainty principle. Um, so it's, again, it's half. The available zero-point energy is assigned then to the kinetic energy in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Once again, we could assume, well, the other half's potential, but um, Actually, if you get good at doing these, they're kind of fun, and so why not do it? So here's the calculation of the expectation value of the potential. I put in one-half m omega squared x squared, and that's integrating by parts twice, but I'm getting awfully good at that. In fact, I can get so good at that I can just do it in my head almost. So that turns out, again, without too much trouble, to be h bar omega over 4. So for the quantum oscillator, the expectation value of the kinetic energy is h bar omega over 4. The expectation value of the potential energy is h bar omega over 4. They are equal. It satisfies the virial theorem once again. Good. Now let's check our wave function. For H2+, plus, the virial theorem says with the minus one um, force, uh, rather, uh, potential function, r to the minus one, the two times the kinetic energy should equal to minus one times the potential energy. Well, we've got our ground state wave function, psi plus. Let's go ahead and, and do it. Um, so this is now an independent check and now you can go back to slide 526 to that online thing and you can see that there's this cryptic thing off to the side virial equals and then it's some number that's very close to minus 2 and that's kind of their quality control their measure 1.9999 who knows if that's just round off you sometimes get something like that at the bottom here, then, of slide 611, I have the expectation value of the kinetic energy, T, is equal to the integral over dr, psi plus, atomic units minus one-half del squared, psi plus, and that is equal to, if I do 
um, everything because I have all the integrals, so I don't have to do anything, I just write it down. That's equal to one half minus s of r over two minus k of r, all divided by one plus s of r. So that's not uh, any big deal because the, um, the uh, derivative of e to the uh, ra is, is just e to the ra, and so that's and the other ones are the definitions of k and s. For the potential, we have to integrate over psi plus of minus 1 over ra psi plus plus the integral over psi plus of minus 1 over rb of psi plus. And that one we end up with minus 1 plus j of r plus 2k of r divided by 1 plus s of r plus 1 over r. I know what all these functions are, and both of them depend on the parameter big R because all these integrals depend on how close the nuclei are to each other. But, so obviously it can't be minus 2 um, for all values of big R, but that's ridiculous because um, what we want to know is at the most stable point does it satisfy it because that's what we're going around. So when R is equal to RE, the equilibrium position, the minimum of the well, how close does it come to satisfying the virial theorem? Well, we know the minimum is 2.493 times the Bohr radius. And if we just put in R is equal to that value, um, because we're in atomic units, we just put in R is equal to 2.493, we end up with the expectation value of the kinetic energy being 0.3827 Hartree and the expectation value of the potential energy being minus 0 0.9475. Um, so that's uh, sad because at the condition, the best condition, R is equal to RE, we end up with this ratio which is minus 2.48, which is way off minus 2. So the auditors have come in and said, you are missing a lot of money. In fact, we have about a 25% error with this function that we worked like crazy to get, and it's still no good. Now, the question is how we can fix it. Well. <clears throat> the one thing that we didn't let the um, atoms do is we didn't let the 1s orbital expand. And you could guess that in order to um, have both of them in the sleeping bag there, that it's got to be a little bit bigger. And therefore, that's what I would try. Unfortunately, that means that we would have to go back um, and calculate everything with our friend Zeta. So although this orbital is not very good, um, we have to take a pretty deep breath um, before we do that. Now that you know about the Virial theorem, you can go back to the other problems we did on because it holds for atoms as well. And you can go back to our attempts on hydride and helium and even the 1s state of the hydrogen atom if you like. And you can figure out the expectation value of T and V. It's a very good exercise. And you can see now you've got an independent check. How did those other wave functions did? Because we were just playing around there looking at the energy, trying to get it to be stable. We never went to this, this level. Well, uh, we're going to have to introduce our friend Zeta again to let the orbitals adjust to the new environment. And that means we're going to have to go back and do all our matrix elements over HAA, HAB, S. I can hear you groaning even though you aren't here. Uh, and I feel your pain. So here is the new orbital. We've got 1 over the square root of pi, e to the minus r. That was a simple one. That's just the 1s. Now it goes to zeta cubed over pi, all to the one-half power, e to the minus zeta r. 
so-called Slater 1s orbital, where zeta is a parameter. And we would have to go through then with this new thing, all our orbital, all our matrix elements over and calculate them. But luckily we don't have to do that <coughs> because somebody's already done it and the Slater orbitals are already tabulated. And so all we have to do is set them up so we recognize whether it's S, J, or K, and then whomp out the answer and we can figure it out pretty quickly. And therefore, rather than working them out blow by blow, like I have done for some of the others, we're just going to um, look them up and we're as a function of zeta, and then we're going to cut to the chase and minimize the thing as a function of zeta, and even that won't be so very easy, but, but let's have a look. Most of the terms are pretty predictable, so here on slide 616, what I've written is T, the, the expectation value of the kinetic energy as a function of zeta and big R, and basically it's very similar to the other things. There's a zeta squared over 2 minus zeta squared and then S and K. Now the S and K are functions of zeta times R because that's what's in the exponent. So they're there together, but then there are some zetas floating around by themselves. And for the potential energy, it's again very similar. There's the one term plus one over R, which is the repulsion of the nuclei. And that one doesn't depend on which electronic orbitals you pick, because that's just dependent on the two positive charges pushing apart. So you could guess that one's not going to have a zeta um, there. And now um, we've got these two things, and we can add them up, and then we can plot the energy, E, as a function of both zeta, which I've plotted on the y-axis on this slide, from, I didn't know what zeta was, but I guessed that zeta would have to be bigger than 1, because I didn't see any mileage in having the orbital shrink. So I thought, well, it's going to be like hydride, probably zeta is bigger than 1. So I plotted it from 1 to 1 and a half, and I didn't know what R over A naught should be either, but um, because the true value was around 2, and the value I got before was like 2.49, um, and I thought if it improves, it should get smaller, so that the orbital should expand, but the nuclei should be held together better. Um, I plotted that from about one and a half to two and a half or so. And bingo, I got a deep minimum. That little red spot, which is almost in the center, by coincidence. In fact, I had to plot it again because I couldn't believe I was that lucky. But I was, and I found that the lowest energy was R over A naught is equal to 2.003 which is fantastic. It's like oh, just about right on. And that was 106 picometers then. And zeta is bigger than 1. It's 1 1.238. That's the numerical answer if you minimize it. And the minimum energy now, <coughs> getting rid of the minus a half, because the minus a half is in there is minus 0 0.08651 Hartree minus 2.345 electron volts or minus 226.3 kilojoules per mole. Way better than before. But now, after we introduce this zeta, let's see what our auditor says. Let's see if the auditor says we made a good move. Well, now I can calculate the expectation value of T with this um, wave function, no big deal, 0.5865 Hartree, and for the potential, minus 1.173, and guess what? It's minus 2.0000, right on the money. So that we improved every aspect of our solution
by letting the uh, 1s orbital expand. That's kind of interesting because we might have taken another strategy. We might have just said, look, we've got to find um, zeta such that the virial theorem satisfied. Um, of course, then we can't use it as a check because we have used it as the input. Um, but we didn't do that. All we said is let's minimize the energy with this extra flexibility and the virial, the auditor came back and said the books are right on. Now that doesn't mean that that's the correct energy. That just means it's not wrong. And so lots of things are like that. It's, it's, it's not obviously wrong, but that doesn't mean it's absolutely correct either. It's somewhere in between. There's lots of solutions that have the virial criterion met and they have different quality. How could we uh, 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 interpret this? Well, starting with just the 1s elect, uh, wave functions is too restrictive. They have to be allowed to stretch to incorporate the, other, the uh, presence of the other nucleus. And that, that's how I would interpret it anyway. The energy is much better. It's still not perfect. Um, and at least the virial theorem satisfied. Now, if we want to do better, we know the prescription. We have to include other functions in the mix. And if you're doing this by hand, you better think long and hard about which functions you're going to include because whichever ones you include, um, you're going to have a mess to integrate. And when you start including more of them, you have many, many, many more integrals to do. And so you do a ton of work and then it doesn't come out any better. And I'm going to show you then uh, in the last part of this, um, this minor sob story. So I'm going to pick something to add to the 1s that isn't a very smart pick, it turns out. And next time we're going to learn why it isn't a very smart pick and how to make a much smarter pick. Well, you might guess that um, sort of like hydride, remember I said we could include a 2s, 1s, 2s, 1s, 2s. Uh, we didn't do that. We included things with two values of zeta. But uh, that'll work. And so what I could include here is I could say, I'm going to take um, some coefficient C1 of 1SA plus 1SB. And these are Slater orbitals, so they already can expand. It's never going to be worse than what I had. Plus a second coefficient of 2SA, 2SB, which again are Slater orbitals. They just have an R. And I really like that because if I have all the Slater orbitals, they're all tabulated and the in I don't have to do any of the integrals. Before the advent of software that would do the integrals for you, that was extremely important because there's no way if you had to do them all by hand you could make any progress. Interestingly enough, here's a table. There's the wave function, here's E min, and here's R sub E. The first entry is the very first thing we did, 1SA plus 1SB, which I've called 1S, zeta equals 1. The minimum energy, including the minus a half now, is minus 0.56483, and RE is 2.49. And if I expand it with zeta is equal to 1.238, then I end up with minus 0.58. 651 and RE is 2. And now I do a ton of work and I get this funky wave function 0.7071 1s with zeta is equal to 1.24 plus 0 0.001 2s with zeta is equal to 1.24 and I get the same energy, minus 0.58651, and I get the same equilibrium bond distance, 2.00. That's really disappointing if we had actually done that calculation. But if you come up, if you say, let's include a smidge 
of something in the wave function. And the smidge is really like a spice at the end, like just a pinch of salt, 0 0.001. What that's telling you right away is that whatever you selected is not very important. Um, it's not going to be on the top of the list of ingredients. What you want to do is you want to figure out what you can add that will end up with a reasonable coefficient, more like 0.1 or something higher, so you can get a clue that it's not going to be very good um, just by doing that. Next time then, what we're going to do is figure out first, by thinking about the problem a little bit more, what kind of function we could add um, without necessarily going through all the calculations because it'll be um, quite difficult. But what kind of function we can add that would improve it even more compared to these Slater 1s orbitals that have expanded. And that will lead us to the idea of including polarization. It really comes down to the fact that S is still spherical and the problem is elliptical. Um, so we wouldn't expect it to improve too much by just adding S because we already let a round thing expand in order to make the um, optimized orbital that satisfied the virial theorem. And we need something that's shaped more like a sausage, which we'll see is going to be a PZ orbital. And we'll do that next time.